Welcome to the Key Chapters podcast on 1 Timothy chapter 2. The church that God blesses is the church that follows God's design. And today in our study of 1 Timothy chapter 2, we're going to see what that design looks like when it comes to prayer, the lost, and the roles of men and women in the church. So welcome to the Key Chapters podcast. We've got a lot to cover, so let's get started. This is day two of our study in Paul's first letter to Timothy. Paul is writing this letter somewhere around 65 AD, and he's writing to Timothy, whom he has urged to stay in Ephesus to iron out some problems that were going on in that church there. The first problem that we talked about yesterday was related to false teachers in the church. There were people who were still teaching the law in Ephesus, and Paul wanted Timothy to go in and establish the foundation of grace and faith in Jesus Christ. In other words, Paul wanted Timothy to help them to get the gospel right. And then once that's in place, we can then go to chapter 2, where the church then also needs to be built on prayer and proper order according to God's design. And so let's look at this structure that Paul's going to give us, starting in verse 1. In verses 1 and 2, Paul says, First of all, then, I urge that entreaties and prayers, petitions and thanksgivings be made on behalf of all men, for kings and all who are in authority, so that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. So, first of all, the church of Ephesus has to be a church of prayer. I love that phrase, first of all. This is the idea that of all the things that the church can be or should be doing, the number one priority is to be a praying church. This is the one activity that is the starting point for everything else that a church does. When they are a praying church, they're a church that's submitted to Christ and seeking His will and joining in His work and accomplishing His purposes. And so, linking this idea of being a praying church back to chapter 1, if they get the gospel right in chapter 1, that will naturally fuel a proper prayer time. They'll understand the stakes, that eternity in hell is an awful fate, and they'll seek for God's saving hand to work among the world. C.H. Spurgeon, an old-time preacher, used to say, if we do not pray for the lost, it is because we are still lost ourselves. And so, God's people pray for the salvation of the lost. Likewise, related to this idea of prayer, they will also understand that the message of the gospel is impossible to believe unless the Holy Spirit gives a person faith and enables them to believe, because salvation and conversion is a miracle. And so, if we're going to be about the ministry of the gospel, we have to be people of prayer because we need God to work. Now, Paul describes this prayer with four terms in verse 1, entreaties and prayers and petitions and thanksgivings. These terms are similar but also different. The term entreaties is rooted in the idea of lacking something. These are prayers based on needs. We are to pray for the needs of those we know and don't know in the world around us. The term prayers are just a general word for praying. The term petitions has the idea of offering familiar repeated requests for something specifically and usually made on behalf of someone else. And finally, the word thanksgiving, it's the Greek word eucharistia, which literally means good gift. And it's the idea that we're recognizing that God has given us good gifts and we're just grateful for what he has given to us. And it's where we're seeing God's hand of providence working in our situation and we recognize God's sovereignty over all that we face and we thank him for what he has brought into our lives. Now, without thankfulness, our prayers can quickly degrade into just running through grocery lists of needs. But when we give thanks in all circumstances, like we saw in 1 Thessalonians 5.18, That takes spiritual work, and that's part of what it means to be offering up to God worship and prayer and praise. And so the first order of business for a church is to gather for prayer, uh, the kind of prayer that goes over everything from urgent needs to minor requests to times of thanksgiving and times of celebration. Now, having said all of that, look who we should be praying for here in verses 1 and 2. Verse 1 goes on to say that these prayers should be made on behalf of all men, Verse 2, for kings and for all who are in authority, so that we might lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. In other words, so that we have the ability to live a life without hindrance. But here's the amazing thing. The church, the people of God, ought to be gathering together and, and giving up some of their own time to pray for all people, even for kings. And in Paul's day, this would include guys like Nero. Well, how can this be? I mean, these people are enemies of God, right? Well, amazingly, God wants us to pray this way. In fact, in verse 3, Paul says this, this kind of praying is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. God wants us to be praying for all men because when we do, we are aligning with the heart of God. In fact, verse 4 tells us that God desires all men to be saved. 
Now, what does this mean? Well, the word desire in the NASB is the Greek word thelo, which means just that, desires or wish or hope. This desire flows out of God's love for the world and the lost. He knows the faith that they're headed towards, and he desires for them to be saved. That's why he sent his son to be our savior. And God not only desires that all men would be saved, he also desires that they would come to a knowledge of the truth. That word know is the Greek word epinosis. We've talked about that many times. Epinosis speaks to the knowledge that pulls together the various pieces of information together to have a deeper understanding. And specifically, God wants the world to know the truth of the gospel that we see in verses 5 and 6. Verses 5 and 6 says, For there is one God, and one mediator also between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all the testimony given at the proper time. And so God desires that all men know that there is just one God, not many gods, not the pagan gods, just one God, Him. And not only that, God desires that all people understand that there is just one mediator between us and Himself, not the priests of the world today, uh, not other religions, not our own works, not our own made-up religion. If we want to have a true and living relationship with God, we need to come to Him only through Jesus Christ, who is our mediator between us and God. Now look at who Jesus is in verse 6. Verse 6 says that Jesus is the ransom for all. Now what does that mean, ransom, and what does it mean by all? Well, when we use the term ransom, we're usually thinking about someone who's been like kidnapped and we're paying a ransom to get them back. But that's not really the idea of this word here. I think that the clearest example of what the word ransom means, it goes back to Exodus chapter 30, verse 12, specifically where the word ransom was paid for every person who wanted to become Jewish. Exodus 30 verses 11 to 16 describes how this ransom was calculated and paid. You see, Exodus 30 describes how they would conduct the census. And anyone who wanted to show that they were truly part of God's people would have to go on over and actually stand with the people of God. And then they would have to pay, each person have to pay a fixed ransom price for themselves. And so with that idea of ransom, here in 1 Timothy chapter 2, Jesus paid the ransom price for anyone who was willing to cross over the line and be counted among God's people. And so then going on to verse 7, this was the message that God appointed Paul to proclaim to the Gentiles. That word preacher there in verse 7 is literally the idea of being a herald. God had commissioned Paul to be a herald and proclaim this message to the world. And therefore in verse 8, Paul says, I want the men in every place to pray, lifting up holy hands without wrath and dissension. In other words, I'm looking for the men to stand on up and be about prayer. And I'm not looking for them to bicker over things like the law that we saw yesterday, but instead to to be praying and leading the church in prayer to get on God's page and be praying for the lost. Now let's turn to a super controversial part of this passage here. Let's just start with me saying that if you've been listening to this podcast for a while, then you know my goal is simply to explain the Word of God so that we understand God's message. I myself am simply just trying to be a herald of God's Word and And sometimes that means teaching truths that I know are difficult to hear. And that's definitely going to be the case in the next set of verses. And so these aren't going to be easy verses, but let's work through verses 9 to 15 together. Starting in verse 9, Paul says, Likewise, I want women to adorn themselves with proper clothing, modestly and discreetly, not with braided hair and gold or pearls or costly garments, but rather by means of good works as is proper for women making a claim to godliness. And so Paul is talking about clothing and modesty. It's not really specifically about can you have braids in your hair, can you wear a gold watch or not. The point is is that God's people, men and women alike, don't wrap themselves up and don't wrap up their identity in things like clothing and fashions or or drawing attention themselves. Instead, they seek to be modest and, and discreet so that people aren't focusing on how they look, but how they live. Verse 11 goes on to say, A woman must quietly receive instruction with entire submissiveness. I recognize that this verse flies in the face of our modern culture, but let's start with just what this verse is telling us here. For one thing, it shows us that women can receive instruction. In fact, this is in the imperative, women should receive instruction. And so we take this for granted, but this was a cultural revolution bound up in a verb tense here. When it comes to things of God, a woman can learn everything that a man does. There are no limitations. And yet Paul tells them to receive this instruction with entire submissiveness. Now, that's not easy to hear, but we got to remember the principle of submissiveness and learning is actually true for both men and women. Everyone is to submit to the Word of God as it's being taught faithfully and accurately. The Word of God, it's not going to be easy to hear all the time. There will be times that our flesh wants to rebel against it, 
But part of growing in the epinosis of God is learning to submit to what we have just learned because it's in this submission with a heartfelt desire to understand what God is saying, where the Holy Spirit will then grant us the illumination to see how the pieces fit together. And so when we come to God's word with this attitude, we will find God's grace and God's spirit giving us an even deeper, richer understanding of these spiritual truths. Going on to verse 12, Paul then writes, But I do not allow a woman to teach or exercise authority over a man, but to remain quiet. Now, we know from 1 Corinthians 11 to 5 that women could teach in the church. And so here, Paul is giving us the parameters of that teaching. It is not to be in a mixed audience where there are men present, specifically in the context where a woman is teaching with authority over the men. I mean, it's okay for a man to be around if a woman's teaching children. He doesn't have to run out of the room because she's teaching the kids, not the men. The issue is about authority. If she's teaching with authority, then the men shouldn't be present there. Now, just in case we're thinking this might be some kind of cultural thing for just back then, but not for today, well, in verses 13 and 14, Paul ties all of this back to Adam and Eve in the fall. Paul says in verses 13 and 14, For it was Adam who was first created, and then Eve, and it was not Adam who was deceived, but the woman being deceived fell into transgression. And Paul's point is, is that if Adam had done his job as the leader of his home, Satan would not have been able to deceive Eve. And yet, now, the whole world has fallen into this state of sin and transgression. Not an easy verse again to hear, and this whole stretch has been challenging, but now let's go to verse 15, which may be the most challenging or confusing of all. Paul says in verse 15, But women will be preserved through the bearing of children if they continue in faith and love and sanctity with self-restraint. Now, in the context, we're seeing here that women will be saved. That word preserved in the NAS is the Greek word for saved. What will they be saved from? Well, they'll be saved from verse 14, the condition of the fall. And how? Well, if we read verse 15 carefully, they are saved through faith that is proven to be genuine by its love and holiness creating self-restraint. And so here in verse 15, salvation comes through genuine faith. But verse 15 gives us another concept that's just one Greek word, and it's the Greek word technogonias, and that's just childbearing. And this one word childbearing here has caused no small controversy, and I doubt because of that word here, we're going to hear very many Mother's Day sermons based on verse 15 here. We don't really know what Paul means by this, and since we're not really sure what Paul means, I'm just going to give you my opinion. You can take it or leave it. For one thing, I'm sure that Paul is not saying that women are actually saved by giving birth. He's just got done talking about the gospel, and we need a mediator between us and God, Jesus Christ. And so he's, he's not saying that women are saved by some other way besides the cross. I personally think that Paul is speaking here in theological shorthand, and he is mentioning kids as an example of what it means to recognize God's design and to be seeking to follow God's design, especially the different roles he's given for men and women. And one of the divinely ordained roles for women is that of having kids and caring for them. This doesn't mean that women are saved by having kids, or that women who don't have kids aren't saved, or that only women should parent the kids. I think Paul is just showing that true faith submits to God's word and God's design, and in God's design, women do have a central role in the life of their children. Okay, so that is 1 Timothy chapter 2, not the easiest chapter we've ever studied. But we see here again that Timothy was to establish God's design for the church in Ephesus, and we see that the church that God blesses follows this design. And so the first design for the church is that we will be a church of prayer. I wonder how many of our churches lack the power of God because we also lack the priority of God for prayer. If you're not a part of your church's prayer meetings, or if you're not seeing God working in your church, Maybe you should be going to his prayer meetings, and when you go, encourage others to go with you so that the whole church is gathering together to seek God in prayer. The world needs churches that are strong in prayer, not just praying for people's health, things like that, but praying for the lost and praying for God's kingdom to be expanding to the world around us. Second, and along with that, God's design for the church is that we have a heart for the lost. These verses here keep us from ever thinking that God doesn't love the world. He does. And when our heart beats with God's heart, we'll love the world too. Not to become like the world and pick up the world's ways, but to announce to the world, to be a herald on behalf of God to the world, inviting them to be gathered with God's people and saved from God's judgment. Finally, God's design for the church is that we will be a church that follows His structure, His design for the roles of men and women in the church as well. Again, these verses are not easy. And yet, like so much of God's word, spiritual maturity is not reached by ignoring God's word or twisting it to fit what we want, but simply to submit to it. And so let us be people who are reading and living and following God's design for the church and for our lives here as well.
Well, we'll end things there. Thanks for listening. I hope you have a great rest of your day. And until tomorrow, God bless.